the Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Now, before we get started, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Scott Schelke is the Autism Safety Specialist for the Autism Alliance of Michigan and has been instrumental in the autism safety training movement in Michigan. Sergeant Schelke has provided training on autism spectrum disorder, most common situations and best strategies for safe outcomes when the situation involves someone with autism spectrum or a mental health disorder to over 15,000 individuals in Michigan. These webinars are made possible through generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website at autism.com. And now I'm going to turn this over to Sergeant Schelke. Thanks, Denise. Uh, today's training is called the Michigan Autism Safety Training. It's an initiative of the Autism Alliance of Michigan. It's a first responder municipal employee field response training. Today you're going to hear me talk about autism and talk about how important it is for the first responders to work with our parents, our care providers, our educators when they're on a call a person with autism. What are we going to learn today? We're going to expand their knowledge of autism and autism behaviors. One of the hardest things for a first responder if they don't know anything about autism, if they haven't received any training, is that a person with autism looks no different than you or I. I'm going to give them some characteristics on how to identify people out in the field. I'm also going to give them some tips how to safely and effectively interact with a person with autism. And if you look at the bottom of that objective, the family member care provider, I encourage my first responders in the field to always work with a family member or care provider. No one knows that person better than they do. They know what triggers their meltdowns. They know how to calm them. They know how to communicate with them. They can make things go a lot easier in the field. We'll also learn some community outreach strategies to increase safety and support of those with autism. Uh, the agenda today, uh, we'll talk about autism. I'll give you the definition of autism, but I put it in plain English for my first responders. I am not a clinician. I am a retired police sergeant, and this is how I understand things. We'll also talk about on-duty situations and, and where the first responder could maybe make a call with a person with autism or interact with them while they're on duty. I'm not going to talk about a lot of studies. You won't hear that in this training. We'll talk about response strategies and some community policing safety. Then we'll have some final thoughts and hopefully we'll have some time for some questions. All right, what is autism? There's the definition. It's a neurologically based developmental disability that seriously affects a person's ability to communicate, socialize, make judgments, and understand perspectives of others. Okay, what is that? It's a brain disorder. A person is born with autism. There is no cure for autism. We don't know what causes autism. Uh, the police officers, I tell them, you'll hear studies almost every day. You'll hear something on vaccines and other things, but there is nothing proven. The only thing we really know about autism it is genetic. If you have one child with autism, you may have another child with autism. Uh, first responders, paramedics, EMTs will ask me, is there a medication for autism? There is no medication specific to autism. Now, a person with autism may have multiple diagnoses where they may take medications for other things such as uh, oh, ADHD, seizures, and so on. Now, the first responders, when they're in the field, I explain to them, they're going to hear three things from the family member, the care provider. They're going to hear my son or daughter has autism, my son or daughter has ASD for autism spectrum disorder, or my son or daughter is on the spectrum. It all means the same, I tell them. It is they have autism. Now, I talk to them about how the spectrum is so wide and that no two people with autism are alike. This is what's so tough. Many times a person with autism may show no physical characteristics that they have autism. Uh, I explain to them the, the why, how wide the spectrum is. On one end, you may have somebody who is very high functioning, uh, such as that term Asperger's, a uh, very high functioning form of autism. Usually they lack social skills. Uh, they may have a favorite subject and they may talk to you all about that and they will tell you everything. They're brilliant people. They're brilliant people, but usually they lack social skills. But on the other end of that spectrum, 
we have somebody who is very low functioning, may be nonverbal, may need an aid to be with them their whole life, may have never been potty trained. So then we have everybody that falls in between. So this is really tough. That first responder one day could be making a call on somebody maybe on a college campus where they have Asperger's or high functioning autism. And six months down the road, they're making a call on a young boy who's nonverbal who has walked away from home. So a, a lot of difference here. Uh, the other thing I tell them is that there is a lot of people out there who have never been diagnosed. We have uh, young adults and adults who are walking our streets, they're living in our homeless shelters, uh, they're being cared for by their elderly parents, they're living or they have been put in our jails. Uh, you may run into people when I explain these characteristics that show these characteristics of autism They have never been diagnosed. So there, there's a lot of that going on too. So that's autism. I, I just like to tell them it's a brain disorder. People are born with autism. There's no cure for autism. Okay, and the, really the only thing we know about is genetic. Now, just some quick facts. With autism, one in 68 American children born now are on the spectrum. One in 42 boys. Boys are four to five times more likely than girls to have autism. Look at that stat, one in 50 school-age children. So if you have a 250 student elementary school in your jurisdiction or the area you live, you have at least five children on the spectrum. We let them know it's a fastest growing developmental disability in the U.S. 65% of the students with autism report being bullied. Here's the hard thing. Some people with autism, probably many people with autism, may not even know they're being picked on. This is really tough. This is where we really need our educators, our bus drivers, our school resource officers to really look out for the person with autism. They're easy victims. They're easily picked on. Uh, they're very trusting of people. Um, autism may or may not be physically obvious. I talked to you a little bit about that. It, it's not like Down syndrome where they may have some obvious physical characteristics. I'll give the first responders, the bus drivers, some characteristics on how to identify people with autism. Here's one. 40% of the children with autism are nonverbal. The one thing I want my first responders to know, my bus drivers, my community organization staff members, is just because they're nonverbal doesn't mean they don't hear. We always talk to them. Okay? Many, many of them can understand what we're saying. It may just take a little longer for them to process things. And it happens everywhere. Uh, we, it happens in inner city Detroit to uh, northern Michigan to anywhere in the United States. There are no boundaries for autism. Now, here's why this training got started. This is an old study, but it's still true today. Many of the autism trainers around the nation look at this in Michigan. The advocacy group that helped wanted this training developed kept coming across this study. Seven times more contact with law enforcement than a member of the general public. Still very true today. There's two reasons for this. One, people misinterpret their behaviors. They will call 911 and say they're they're intoxicated, they're high on drugs, they're thieves. Uh, the other thing is a person with autism may put themselves in danger. We know that almost half of the children dangerously wander from a safe environment. We also know about the drowning in the autism community. 91% of the deaths, I think the National Autism Association did a study, 91% of the deaths, children 14 and under, were due to drowning between 2009-2011. It all led from dangerous water. So when I talk about this dangerous wandering call to my first responders, it is a priority call. We need to get on the call right away. Too much can happen. Different uh, trainings we're doing around the state of Michigan. Um, I'm just I'm not going to read over these. I'll let you look at them. Uh, when I helped develop this training, I told them we just can't train the police officers and the firefighters. If you want this to work, this program, we need to train the full circle. So we're training police officers, first responders. We're training bus drivers now. Who's the first person that sees that child in the morning? A lot of responsibility. We're training child protective services workers foster care families and workers. Uh, we trained organizations such as the Detroit Zoo, Henry Ford Mich Museum, the Michigan Children's Museum. So we're training the full circle. If you want this to work, if you're going to start a training in your area, you just can't train the cops and the firefighters. The full circle has to be trained. 
So we're also training the families to be proactive on their end. All right, the, this is a way for uh, police officers, firefighters, and other community members to identify a person with autism if they're not being told. Uh, different types of characteristics. We have our communication characteristics. We have verbal and nonverbal communication. Uh, there's many different ways a person with autism can communicate. Uh, I will talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, we tell them they have a challenge understanding words. They're very literal. When talking to them or communicating with them, keep it very simple and direct. We don't use any slang. Uh, we don't use any idioms. Don't say, hey, Scott, what's up your sleep today? Because Scott's going to look what's up his sleep, and he's not being a smart bot to you. Keep it very simple and direct when talking to them. Uh, you may need pictures to communicate. You may have to break something up on your laptop. You may have to draw something. Echo in words or phrases. It's called echolalia. They may repeat back what you're telling them. They re may repeat a 30-minute sitcom. Uh, that they watched the night before. So it may be something so unusual for their age, uh, a person such as my age talking about Thomas the Train, which is very popular, I think, in the autism community. It may seem unusual. Our red flag should be going up. Talking to their self or no one specifically. Well, we know a lot of people talk to themselves, but mainly a person with autism or a lot of times they're talking about their favorite subject. Uh, so our red flag should be going up. And again, it could be something so unusual for their age. Difficulty expressing needs or wants. I have the picture of the little boy with his hands over his ears. I explained to our first responders, our bus drivers, that there's two things going on here. If you see their hands over their ears, their fingers in their ears, their hands over their eyes, they could be filtering, uh, filtering out loud noises, bright lights, smells, anything that you or I could ever or filter out on a daily basis may be very hard for them. Uh, I explained to them, if you ever see a person wearing an earmuffs out in public, this may be what they're doing. The other thing we need to watch out for, something could be scaring them, upsetting them. There's a term in the law enforcement world called fire flight. They could be heading toward this. It could be the large crowd around them. It could be taking out them taking out their daily routine. Somebody sitting in their seat on the school bus. It's upsetting to them. So we're really watching for this. Pretty, pretty obvious characteristics, uh, pretty common characteristics. Uh, the other thing, a little inappropriate giggling or laugh, and they may real, talk real high, talk real low. Uh, so these are some of the common characteristics of communication. Now remember, a person with autism, to be diagnosed with autism, has to have some of these characteristics we're talking about today. A lot of it's sensory, a lot of it's repetitive. Then we have our social characteristics. It says prefers to be alone. Uh, it doesn't mean they don't want to have friends. They lack social skills. It's tough for them. The young children may be mainstreaming in school for the first time. Uh, the young adult going out in the job market when they've, they, they've had no supports their whole life and they have to now go into the interview process. Or they have to work in a new, in a new setting where uh, maybe they say something inappropriate. They say something that's on their mind, being they're very literal. Uh, difficulty interacting with others, uh, the same thing. Here's something I really like the first responders to look out for, the attachment to objects. A person with autism could be carrying something so unusual that they're attached to. My word to the first responders, the community member staff is, if the object isn't hurting anyone or anybody else, don't ever take it from them. Okay? That's keeping them calm. Let them have it. The only time we would take that object from them if it's hurting them or someone else. Uh, it, it could be something, you know, a guy my age carrying around a stuffed toy and they, they seem fixated on it. It doesn't mean they're not listening to you. Uh, dangerously attracted to water. I talked about the drowning in the autism community. They say it's a sensory thing. They like the way it looks. They like the way it feels. They like the way it sounds. They're drawn to water. In my family community training, I encourage the families to get swim lessons right away. And just don't go for six weeks. Keep them going to these lessons. Give them a chance. Also, always keep somebody around them when they're on water. Never leave them alone. Uh, we talk about that they may be attracted to roadways. They like repetitive things. Planes, trains, and automobiles, one parent told me. But we, we have a couple individuals I know of in Michigan who like to watch traffic at intersections all day long. And I know the local law enforcement agencies get calls like mad to go check them. Uh, they're, they're simply watching traffic. Some may like to ride the 
local uh, mass transportation buses around their city all day long. They like repetitive stuff. Here's something they may do too uh, for the police officers, the firefighters, the 911 operators. They may enter into an occupied or unoccupied dwelling. This can be very common. They may enter into a home unannounced, sit down, start eating something, watch TV, jump on a computer. They may walk into a business and walk right by the front desk and just start walking in and out of buildings. The problem with this is it can be very dangerous for them. Uh, a homeowner may think they're being broken into. A uh, business may think they're being broken into. This is very dangerous. This is why it is so important for the families to educate everybody around them, their neighbors, uh, their local, the YMCA's, the, the locations their family member may want to go to, the schools that they attend. Everybody has to know that my son or daughter has autism. They may wander. Our third type of characteristic is repetitive and sensory. Many people with autism avoid eye contact. This is probably one of the most common characteristics. Now, teaching our first responders that avoiding eye contact may be a, a characteristic of autism needs to be told. Because as a police officer, one of the first things you learn when you're interviewing a person is if they're not telling you the truth, they have a very hard time looking you in the eye. We have to get by that with autism. Uh, many, some or many may not like to be touched. When we're in the field, I, I tell them, we only touch a person with autism for their safety or someone else's until we get to know them better. Okay? Uh, we have school resource officers across the state of Michigan, across the country who get hugs every day from these children. That's what we want. We want the person with autism to know that they can come to the police officer or firefighter in uniform if they're scared, they're being picked on, they're bullied, they're lost. We want that to happen. Uh, very high tolerance of pain, some of them. Uh, always, always check them if there's any chance they've been hurt. Err on the side of caution. Call EMS over to the scene or take them to the emergency department to have them checked out. But we always err on the side of caution. Some other uh, characteristics, some may rock back and forth standing. They may do it seated in the back of our cars at our depth. They may spin or twirl objects. Uh, they may have unusual repetitive actions, arm flapping, their fingers going up and down, uh, a lot of things like this. Uh, limited fine motor skills, they may not be able to write. They may not be able to tie their shoes. So I know as a police officer, we used to have people write out their own statements. We used to have them sign forms. They may not be able to do this. We explain that to them. Uh, unusual response to light, sounds, other sensory input. We explain to the first responders that we may have to shut down those overhead lights on our patrol cars, those ambulances turn the siren, the air brakes off, uh, just get rid of this stuff because it may trigger a meltdown, sensory overload for the person with autism. Uh, we may tell them that they may also see toe walking, have some difficulty running, which some of them don't have difficulty running. Uh, they're also fascinated with uh, shiny objects. So while we're talking to them, they may get fixated on our badges, our collar pins. If they, uh, woman is wearing some really nice jewelry, they may get fixated and actually want to reach out and try and touch this. So these are some of the different characteristics of a person with autism. You're, you have to remember that everybody with autism is different and that they, they may have some of these characteristics, they may have a lot, they may share some with others, but this may be a way you identify a person with autism if you're not being told. Some of our on-duty situations a police officer, a firefighter, a first responder may come in contact with. We may get check subject calls. The person watching traffic at an intersection all day long. Uh, a person up at 3 in the morning walking around in their pajamas because they can't sleep. Uh, the child not sleeping. When the neighbor, sometimes we get nosy neighbor calls. Why is this child up at 2 in the morning? Well. Maybe if they understood what was going on in the house, we know that in the autism world there's a lot of sleep deprivation. Uh, these children may be up at 2 or 3 in the morning. Just some of the types of calls we may get from on duty. Now, the leading call for law enforcement and first responders is a wandering or missing person. The actual term is called elopement. I explained to the police officers, firefighters, they will probably never hear elopement in the field. 
that's a legal term. They are going to hear my son's a runner, my daughter's a runner, you may hear dangerous runner. If this call goes out of a person missing with special needs or autism, this is a priority call. We need to get on the call right away. Too much can happen. Uh, a person, the first officer and the deputy at the scene should interview the family and ask the family where they have wandered to in the past, where are their favorite locations. Many times when they wander, they may wander to this favorite location. The other officers, the deputies, the firefighters, first responders in the field need to go to our water sites immediately. I told you they are drawn to water. We need to get to our water sites. It could be a lake, it could be a creek, it could be an aquatic center, a swimming pool. We need to check our water sites immediately. Find out from the family if they are wearing any type of GPS tracking device or Project Lifesaver. If they are wearing a GPS tracking device, the family can track that child or person with autism from their smartphone or their computer. Also, the call center from where the device was purchased. The Autism Alliance of Michigan, we use Angel Sense and Amber Alert. You can call that call center and they will start tracking them. The problem here is a lot of people with autism may have sensory issues. They won't wear these devices, so that's really tough. Now, a Project Lifesaver ban, if you have Project Lifesaver in your community, the local police or fire department or sheriff's office can bring the tracking device to the scene and start tracking the, the person that's missing from the device. So find out if they're wearing a tracking device. The other thing, we usually bring a police canine or tracking canine to the scene. Find out from the family member if they're scared of canines or not. And this can go two different ways. Some people with autism may be very scared of that canine. We need to let the handler know this, because that person, when they do find them, if they either see the dog or hear the dog, they may bolt on them again. We need to let the handler know this. Others have no fear of a canine, and they may want to come up and grab onto the canine, pull their ears or something, not meaning any harm, but they don't understand what the dog is going to do. We need to let the handler know this stuff. We're probably always going to use a canine, but we just need to let the handler know this information. The other thing we need to do at the scene is make sure someone at the scene is keeping in touch with our 911 center. We do not want to hold any calls of an unwanted guest, a trespasser, when the person we're looking for could be in a home two blocks away and we're holding that call because it's a non-priority call. Someone at the incident command or maybe possibly a command officer at the home needs to stay in touch with that 911 center. That is so important. So the big thing here is we check our water sites immediately. We find out from the family where their favorite locations are at or where they have wandered to in the past, and we also check those locations. We find out if they're scared of canines or not. We make sure the 911 center isn't holding any calls at all. Okay, that, that is so important. All right. So just remember, if that wandering or missing person call goes out, it is a priority call. Never turn down any mutual aid. Too much can happen very quickly. We want to get on this call right away. All right, now we're going to move on. With the on-duty situations, we're also going to talk about out-of-control person. In the autism world, the term is going to be called a meltdown. Now, probably the dispatch call is going to be out of control person or something similar, depending on what the jurisdiction calls it. I am going to talk to you in a little bit on how to handle a meltdown. Now, the thing is, a meltdown can happen anywhere. It could be on a school bus pulled over on the side of the road. It could be at the home of the child or the person with autism when the parents can't control them. As these children and young people get older, and they have an adrenaline rush, they become very strong. The, you don't ever want to underestimate a child's strength or a person with autism strength. It's all about de-escalation. We're going to talk about the meltdown here in a little bit. Like I said, it can happen anywhere. Uh, for vehicle accidents, at an accident scene, we want the families to have autism identifiers on their, on their vehicle. It could be a, a cling, and the big thing here is it just we want it to say autism on there. So when the first responders are walking up to a car or possibly a professional who's being trained, they're seeing that autism identifier in a car, 
they know that we cannot leave a person with autism alone. We may be working on mom or dad with a minor head injury in the front seat, and we have that young person or that child in the back seat. They become upset. They're taken out of their daily routine, and they run out of that vehicle in the middle of the highway, and they get hit by the car. We don't want that. We want to assign a first responder to them. We want to check up for injuries very well. The best thing we could do is turn them over to their family members or a care provider, someone who knows them if they're not injured. Now, the Autism Alliance of Michigan, we have contact cards. This is a vehicle contact card. It's in your handouts. We want the families to have a handout in their vehicle, hopefully in their glove compartment, maybe up on their visor. Some of the families in Michigan are actually Velcroing them to the back of the driver's seat because their child sits behind there. But we're teaching our first responders to look for this. It says key information to assist responders. Wouldn't it be nice to know how the child communicates if we have to take care of the child or care for the child while mom or dad are being treated by EMF? Main emergency numbers. We want contact numbers and addresses on these cards so we can get grandma and grandpa there to help out to turn the child over to them. On back of it, medical conditions and allergies. If they're going to the hospital, this is going with EMF to that ER. Uh, they need to know. Then we have ways to keep occupied. Why well, always explain to the officers? Well, think about this. The child's in the back seat of your car. Mom's going to the hospital. Their van's getting towed away. He's attached to his iPad, and the van's getting towed and iPad's in there. How long do you think the child's going to last in the back of your car? Not very long, okay? We want the parents to write anything in here that can help care for their child. It may be give them a pad of paper and a pencil, give them his iPad, give them his squishy toy. Just some examples on how we can care for their family member. Okay, so with these contact cards are so important. We also have a contact card for the home that we want kept up on the refrigerator. It's a lot larger version. We also want that contact card at school because we know that some of these wanderings happen at schools from a safe environment. We also want them brought to their local police and fire department and their information entered into our 911 database so that any type, any type of call to their address, there's going to be an add-on from dispatch that there is a person in that home with autism and they can put whatever information they want. Maybe he's a runner. Maybe he or she is nonverbal. Um, don't leave the door open, anything like that to help that first responder at the scene. Now, we also talk about some types of investigations our first responders may run into. Uh, we talk about computer investigations. Uh, as we know, a lot of our persons with autism, our young people, are on computers. Uh, the iPad's been a phenomenal tool. Uh, but we may see some inappropriate things happen on the, on the computer. That's why we really ask the family member or care provider to monitor their family member's computer use. It's so important. Uh, we may also see, uh, I've had parents call me where their son or daughter high enough functioning to have a driver's license, but when they were ran a red light and they were going to be stopped by the police, they didn't stop. They drove straight home and led the police officers on a pursuit. Uh, having these autism identifiers in the windows may help the police officer realize that maybe there's something else going on here. Maybe they're upset. Uh, so there's different types of investigations, but uh, a lot of computer investigations. Uh, you know, you may see the uh, trespassing calls and that and so on, but uh, those are the main things we want to look out for. Now, some of our on-duty situations, risk and behaviors, we talk to the police officers, first responders. A person with autism may not recognize them as an authority figure. They may not know what's expected. That can be very tough if they haven't been trained. We're conducting safety fairs around the state of Michigan where we help the families develop safety plans for their home, school, and their community. But we also have the police officers, the firefighters, the 911 center, they're the school bus drivers, the ambulance drivers in uniform so they can meet them. We want them to know that they can come to us if they're lost, scared, they're hurt, they're being picked on. That's so important. We also want to work with them on how to uh, approach a police officer in public. Uh, how do I communicate with a person with autism? 
Uh, this can be tough if you're not being told how to communicate. Many different ways a person with autism can communicate. Uh, some will talk just like you or I. Some may have limited vocabulary. Again, the one thing I want them to remember is that many of them still hear and can understand. They may be nonverbal, but we always talk to them. Are there some that can understand? Sure, I do understand that, but many of them can understand. It just may take them a little longer to process things. Uh, I explained to them some of the younger children may be using sign language now. Uh, I talk, talk to them about where to find a person that knows sign language. A lot of your emergency departments will have somebody on call. Uh, your local college disability offices may have somebody on call. Your department or community may have somebody on call that will come out and help you. Uh, some are using PEC boards to communicate. Uh, some are using uh, that iPad with those nonverbal apps. It's just been a phenomenal tool for people who are nonverbal to communicate. We also put out a communication board. We give this to all of our first responders, our uh, child protective services workers, our foster care workers. Uh, we have one in it's in your handouts. It's in English and Spanish. One side's more fire EMS. The other side's more law enforcement. I explained to them, this is just a tool. This may be a way you can communicate with them. If it works once, it's worth it. I, I would copy it off. I'd laminate it. I would have every one of my officers, detectives carry in them. Firefighters have it in their uh, rigs, have it in their medical bags, have it available to them. So many different ways they can communicate. We talk about that. Uh, other things we need to look out for, I talked to you about the echolalia, many, many behaviors that draw attention. People misinterpret these behaviors, so we explain that. Here's a couple things they may do, too. Uh, we talked about that lack of eye contact, the indicators of guilt, having to get by that, but they may also change the topic on you. I'm trying to talk to the person on how they were injured. I'm trying to talk to them about who's, who took their bicycle, and he or she wants to talk about Pokemon or Thomas Train, their favorite subject. There's a lot of patience needed in the autism world. We have to be very patient with them. So just some different things we look out for. Uh, there we go. Uh, approaching a person with autism, uh, we have to approach in a very quiet and non-threatening manner. A lot of times as a police officer, you have to use your command voice. Sometimes that's what people understand out in the field. Uh, sometimes, depending on the time of day and how much alcohol has been drank, that's all they understand. But with a person with autism, I explain to them, our command voice may scare them. We have to approach them in a quiet, non-threatening manner. We give them their space. We, we make sure they're unarmed. Officer safety is so important, but so is the person with autism. Check them for injuries, do a good visual, make sure they're not in, injured, and avoid touching them. I, I'll say this three to four times during my training. Only touch them for their safety or that of someone else until you get to know them. Now, always talk to them. Talk to them. Give them time to respond. If they're not communicating back to you, you can look for a medical tag or identification. I, I explained to them there's many different ways a person with autism can identify themselves. Uh, with their sensory issues, it's very hard for many of them to carry any type of ID. I, I would like every person with ID or with autism to carry an ID and be able to present that to a first responder. That would be great, but I know that's not going to happen. Some may have a medical ID bracelet if they can wear it. Uh, some of the younger children are wearing temporary tattoos or shoe tags. Some of the parents actually are using a Sharpie pen. One parent in Michigan told me, Sharpie's her best friend. Uh, she writes her son or daughter's phone number across her forearm because that's the only way she can keep that phone number on her son. She also writes with a Sharpie on the inside of his clothes, phone number and name. That's the only way she can keep anything on him. She also takes a photo of her son every day, every day, because she knows if he goes missing, she can always text that photo with the clothes he's wearing that day, or email it to the 911 center as the officers or firefighters at scene. So it's just a great idea by a parent taking taking a daily photo. So we got to speak calmly to them, keeping it simple and direct. Yep. 
you have a lot of praise and encouragement. Uh, you can allow for a delayed response time. Uh, you're going to need to do this. It's how they're processing things. You know, when you're talking to someone, usually your conversation can be going back and forth pretty quick. But with a person with autism, I explained, it may take them longer to identify or longer to understand what you're saying to them. So it's not unusual. You may have to repeat things, rephrase it, but keep it simple and direct. Now, now, if you have additional units coming to help you, I, I may have called for a backup unit that come from across the city or the county. If it's not an emergency situation anymore, if I have them all settled down, I'm going to let my other officers know to shut those lights and sirens off. It's not an emergency situation. All the work I've done to settle that child down may go right out the door. When my partner pulls down the street with his lights and sirens, the person with autism becomes upset. Uh, they may bolt from the scene. Uh, so shut those lights and sirens down. Uh, give them some space. Uh, do exactly what you want them to do. It says model calm body language. Give extra personal space. Do exactly what you want them to do. A lot of praise and encouragement works very well. Works well with everybody. In the autism world, I, I really encourage you. A lot of praise and encouragement. If they're doing what you want them to do, a lot of praise and encouragement. Uh, remember, you may have to use some pictures. You may have to write something down. They may have a communication board that you're using out there. But the other thing I really would like to see is being a non-threatening person, a lot of patients. Keep your hands in very close to your side, very close to your side. No rabbit pointing or waving. You can tell them you're a police officer, uh, but uh, also use your first name. A lot of times, first name is a great way to break the ice, build good rapport. What I would do is tell them my name's Scott, I'm a police officer, I am here to help you, I am not going to hurt you. I would keep encouraging them to do what they're doing, if they're doing the right thing. Uh, come on, walk with me, you're doing a great job, I'm not going to hurt you, my name's Scott, I'm a police officer, we're going to walk over here to my car. Just keep encouraging them, so important. Now, some of the officers, or some of the persons at the, at the scene may not like our uniforms, I explained to the first responders. Who knows why? Usually it's something that's happened in the past. Uh, you know, maybe they were handcuffed. Maybe mom got a ticket and uh, mom didn't like getting a ticket too much from the officer. Uh, they also don't do well with change of routine, I tell them. Many of them are set in routine. So us taking them out of their routine, maybe taking them to the emergency department instead of taking them to school where they should have been a half hour ago and they know they're not there. This can be very, very upsetting to them. So be prepared for that. Uh, don't interpret lack of cooperation or failure to respond as lack of cooperation. They may simply not understand. Now, I encourage my first responders, anybody, the uh, community mental health staff here in Michigan, our child protection services workers, if you have a family member or a care provider that you can work with at the scene, always work with a family member or care provider. That could be mom, dad, grandma, grandpa. That could be a school teacher, a para pro in school. Nobody knows that person better than they do. They know how to calm them. They know what triggers their meltdown. They know how to communicate with them. Always work with that care provider. Uh, if we're responding to the scene and maybe it's a school, we want to talk to that. It's not an emergency situation talk with that care provider. I also encourage my educators, my care pros, uh, care providers to meet that officer, that deputy, and, and talk to them about it if we have time. And I tell them also, don't stop any of that arm flapping, the finger movement, uh, maybe pulling on their skin or any of, that, any of that repetitive behavior. If it's not hurting anything, don't stop it. It doesn't mean they're not paying attention to you. It doesn't mean that they're not listening to you. You're probably going to make things worse if you reach in there and grab onto their hands or arms and say, hey, come on, calm down now. You're probably going to make things worse. So let that repetitive behavior go unless they were hurt themselves or someone else. Now, some of the things we may need to do at the scene, uh, we may have to remove our canine partners. We know 
we love our canine partners in the law enforcement world, but when many times when our handlers, canine handlers, get out of that car, that dog barks because they're trained to protect that handler. Uh, we may have to turn them siren lights off, and we may have to remove them from a crowd. A crowd is one of the worst places for a person with autism. Uh, that could be simple at a home. That could be the bedroom, a different bedroom where nobody's at. They could be an empty classroom. Uh, that could be walking them to the other side of the fire truck at an accident scene, somewhere away from the crowd so that uh, they don't become upset. Now, what do we do at the scene in case of a meltdown? Uh, I explained to our first responders that a meltdown is a big nasty tantrum in the autism world. It could be anything from self-injurious behaviors, or running out in the middle of traffic, jumping out of a moving vehicle when mom and dad are trying to keep them seatbelts up, to uh, crying, screaming, pouting, stomping their foot. Uh, the first responders could be sent anywhere. When a person with autism has this meltdown, little things can cause their meltdowns. All right, uh, They become very strong when they have these adrenaline rushes. We need to be prepared for that. Uh, the big thing here is all about de-escalation. Okay? Give them their space. The only time we would ever go hands-on if they're hurting themselves or someone else. Just give them their space. Uh, many of the care providers will tell you that the left set is better. Just give them their space. Don't give them, don't say anything. Give them time to calm down. Others have told me that uh, try talking to them about their favorite subject. It may help bring them around. Notice I said may. It may help. So find out what their favorite subject is. They may be wearing clothes that have it on. Uh, they may have a lunch pail, a backpack that has their favorite subject. You're in a bedroom at the house. Look up on their bedroom wall. They may still have their uh, dinosaurs on the wall and be in their early 20s, but they love talking about it. Uh, ask a family member care provider what their favorite thing is. Ask them. It may work, but the big thing here is just give them their space. They're not hurting anybody. Uh, let them de-escalate on their own. It can take minutes for them to settle down. Uh, now, I explained to the police officers, the firefighters, that some educators, some community mental health staff providers are trained in CPI training crisis prevention intervention training. They may go hands-on and snug a person real tight with autism. Generally, law enforcement first responders aren't trained in this, but they may see this at the scene. Okay? They actually had a, a fight call go out in the state of Michigan at an intersection. The police officers responded to the call, and they thought it was a fight, but it was mom snugging her child, trying to calm him down, keep him from running in traffic. So they may see this. Uh, Many times, if, if there's no training for the police officers, firefighters, if they don't know a person with autism, they may misinterpret their behaviors as somebody high on drugs or that. So this is where this training really helps out. A little bit of awareness goes a long way. Now, I will tell the first responders, the police officers, I'll never tell them not to use their tools, their pepper spray, their tasers. But what I do tell them is, that a person with autism may not understand why they're getting sprayed. It could make things worse. It could set things off. So uh, I really, really talk about de-escalation and uh, not going hands-on. Now, in, in the law enforcement world, what some of the things we really have to watch out for in our liability purposes if we go hands-on is avoiding positional asphyxia. We talk to them that some people or persons with autism may have what's called hypotonia, loose muscle around the joints. Uh, pain cupping them, we may be able to take their arm all the way up behind their head. We could be dislocating their elbow. We could be uh, breaking their elbow with their high tolerance of pain, lack of communication. They may not be able to tell us it. But if the person also has hypotonia, they may have underdeveloped trunk muscles in their chest cavity. And while they're on their stomach, we're handcuffing them for their own safety. While they're on their stomach and we're securing them, they may not be able to breathe. So we need to watch out for this. We want to roll them on their side. We want to set them up as soon as possible for normal breathing and monitor them. We, we haven't seen this a lot, but it does exist out there in the autism world, it also exists in other diagnoses. So this is something we really need to be careful with. 
I always tell them, keep talking to the person. It's hard for a law enforcement officer when your adrenaline goes way up and you're struggling with a person or maybe you're chasing after a person so they don't get hit by a car, then to bring yourself back down. A lot of patients in the office world, keep talking to them, use your first name, tell them you're not going to hurt them, you're here to help them, but keep talking to them. We also talk to them about keeping proper distance from a person with autism. Now, you know, a person with autism may invade your space. They may get right up in your face. They may know no social boundaries. But we talk to them. Police officers in general will keep a six to eight foot distance. It's a safety distance. It's a reactionary gap. But we also talk to them about not standing behind them. Sometimes when they're touched, they may suddenly lurch backwards. They, they, they may headbutt you. We've had deputies, officers headbutted. We've had uh, educators headbutted. So keeping our distance, if we can, and we have to walk and go hands on with them, we'd like to try and be on their side and take them by their, their arm, keep explaining and talking to them. We're not going to hurt them. Remain calm and try and work them out of that location so they don't get hurt. So the big thing with the meltdown, it's all about de-escalation. Uh, and just being patient and taking our time. The last thing we want to do is go hands-on with a person with autism or special needs. Okay. If a arrest has to be made of a person with autism, I explain to our police officers, our deputies, that it's a case-by-case -case basis. Everybody with autism is different. Some people may understand what's going on, but many people with autism don't understand what's going on. They're very easy victims, okay? If we have to arrest on a person with autism, we need to let our jail and detention staffs know that we're bringing in a person with autism or we believe they have autism. A person with autism will not do well in a general population cell. They need to be put in a isolation cell, they need to be monitored. We want a family member or a care provider to come to the jail and explain to the deputies or the detention staff on how to care for their family member. Now, some of the jails in the state of Michigan, after they've been through our trainings, are allowing a person with autism, if they're attached to an object and they're put in an isolation cell, they're allowing them to keep that object as long as it can't be used as a weapon in any way. Uh, their feeling is it's going to keep them calm because we know they've been taking over their daily routine. The last thing those deputies, those detention officers want to do is be going back there every 10 minutes to that isolation cell. They don't want to strap them down in a chair, which every jail probably in the nation now has chairs where people are out of control. They'll strap them in the chairs. This is high liability when you start doing that. So they're allowing them to keep that object. Now, what I do recommend if you're arresting a person with autism, if it's a minor case and it's safe to do so and your policy allows you to, I would write the report up and I would turn them over to a family member, a care provider, or I would do a jail diversion. Take them to your local community mental health or your behavioral health unit. A person with autism, jails are one of the worst places for them. We don't want them in jail. Now, we could have a homicide. We could have a domestic abuse case where maybe he's just choked mom. Probably not a good idea to let him go back there at this time. Okay, So that would be a case where we may have to keep them in jail. But I would really look at a jail diversion program if you have one. Uh, we have jail diversion programs in the state of Michigan now where we can divert to our local community mental health or behavioral health center. So that is so important. Now, if we have to go to an emergency department with a person with autism, uh, I encourage my first responders to call ahead, my child protective services workers to call ahead. Let the emergency department know you are coming with a person with autism or you believe the person has autism. Ask for a private room. Don't make them wait in the lobby. They will not do well. We have people who are sick there. We have children who are crying. We have our intoxicated people who are strapped down on cots, who are yelling and screaming nasty things, don't make them wait in the lobby. Get them back in that private room. I would turn my radio down. 
Um, I would ask my partner to go let the nursing staff and doctors know we're here, that we believe the person has autism or we know they have autism. Um, I would ask my partner to call the 911 center to see if we have any missing persons call or call the contact numbers on the emergency contact card. Let's get family or care providers here as soon as possible to turn this person over to them. Emergency departments, there's so much going on there with all their sensory issues and that. This is a very hard place for our people with, with autism. The big thing here is we never leave them alone. If we're going to turn them over to maybe child protective services, adult protective services, foster care, we make sure we're communicating that either we know the person has autism or we're seeing the signs of autism. We need to let them know they can't be left alone. Now, our first responders are generally we're all required reporters of neglect and abuse. Okay? I will never tell a police officer, a firefighter, a child protective service worker to not report neglect or abuse. This slide just basically I talked to them a little bit about what they may see in a home with autism. Uh, I explained to them that you could be walking into one of the most stressed out homes. Uh, you may see a child who's up at 2 or 3 in the morning and you're getting called over there to check the welfare of this child. I talked to them about the sleep deprivation and what the parents do to uh, keep their child safe from wandering. I explained to them they may see multiple deadbolt locks up and down the doors of this house. You may see alarms on the windows. You may see screws two inches above the window so the family can only open the window two inches. Uh, you, may see, you may see a child or a person who gets locked in a bedroom at night. Uh, we do not recommend this, but when the wandering and the elopement is that bad, uh, we do understand in some cases. Uh, usually when it's that bad, that, that's a home that's very stressed out. Uh, I'll tell my police officers, firefighters, always ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Educate yourself on what's going on. Uh, you may see things with no furniture. Maybe they've broken up all the furniture in their home. Uh, maybe they jump off it. Uh, no sheets, blankets, or pillows. Maybe they still wet the bed. Uh, maybe they're learning a daily living skill where uh, one of the biggest things I hear from the families, what's going to happen to my son or daughter when I'm gone? They're, they're worried. And if their child can learn a daily living skill, maybe they can mainstream it. Like maybe they can go to college, live in a residential home. So these are some of the things you're seeing. Uh, also, one of the things you may see is the behavior called pica, the eating of non-edible items. Some common things consumed, I tell the officers, are dirt, feces, drywall, paint chips. We, we had a young man in Michigan swallowing batteries. The Child Protective Services worker was called to the scene by a deputy in that county, and the young boy was swallowing batteries. So it could be anything. A lot of these families and the schools that the children go to have to lock up everything at all times. So you could see a refrigerator and a freezer with padlocks on them. So this may be what's going on in this home. So really this slide is basically to talk about what the officers may see. Uh, you know, you're probably walking into a very stressed out home. The parents have a lot on their mind, how to keep their child safe, how to care for them. So just basically what, what you're going to see in a home with autism. Uh, I do explain to them that, you know, a lot of times I work, I talk about worst case scenario. Uh, I like them to know that there's also a lot good going on in the autism world. But uh, generally when we're getting called as a police officer or first responder, it's usually something bad has happened. All right. Uh, we're nearing the end of our presentation. Uh, basically, when I'm talking to the first responders, uh, I really encourage them to get to know the people in their community with special needs and autism. I believe a little bit of awareness can go a long way when something bad happens. Uh, we're having safety fairs in the state of Michigan where we will work with the local police or fire department 911 center. We set up a production line of our emergency contact cards. Uh, we have the family bring their child or family member in with special needs or autism. We take a picture of them. Uh, we help them fill out the cards. We laminate them so they can take the cards, one for home to keep maybe up on the refrigerator, one for school. There should always be an emergency contact card at the school, and one for their local police, fire department, 911 center. We want the families to bring
bring these cards to the local police department, sheriff's office, fire department, and 911 center. This is a time where I encourage the families to also bring their son or daughter down to their local police fire department, uh, introduce them to the officers, the deputies, the firefighters, get them to know the officers, the deputies in their community. So if they wander away at 3 or 4 in the morning, who's usually out at that time? It's our first responders. They may know who they are, or they may know that they have a contact card back at the, their department they can look at to see where the child or person lives. So this is so important. I encourage the educators to invite the police officers, firefighters in uniform out to the scene or, or to their classrooms where the officers, firefighters can generally just sit in there with uniform and let the, uh, the classroom, the children ask them about their uniforms, about their, their tools, their toys. We, we as in law enforcement always like to show off our toys. So uh, things like this. A little bit of awareness. Not only can the first responder learn from that child or person in that setting, this controlled setting, they can also learn a lot from us. And when we go out in the field and we make that meltdown call, generally these, these young people with special needs or autism remember us, and it can really go a long way. Uh, I also encourage our first responders if they're patrolling their neighborhoods and they know they have a family with special needs or a child with autism or a family member with autism, stop by and introduce yourself. Uh, you know, let them know that you've been trained in autism. If there's anything you can do to help, please let them know. Offer up these emergency contact cards. Uh, also, have something want to sit in your car, you know, check it out. A uh, little bit of awareness goes a long way. I really believe that the little bit we do on the front end can really help out when that call goes out, that uh, wandering call, that meltdown call. So a little bit of work on the front end really goes a long way. Now. All these emergency contact cards I have shown to, or talked about today, the student emergency contact card, the vehicle emergency contact card, also our communication board, and we also have an ID for persons with autism or special needs on there that you can copy off. You can all download those from our website, the Autism Alliance of Michigan, which we're going to show you here in a little bit. We also have two other forms, our Emergency Situation Annual Drills form and our Common Behaviors and Responses form. Basically, what we found out was some of the educators, some of the school, and I'm saying some, not all, because many of them are doing a good job, were not including children with autism, students with autism, or a person with special needs in their emergency drills, such as active violence drills, uh, fire drills, tornado drills, bus evacuation drills. Well, this is wrong. These children, these students, need to be trained, okay? And there are ways we can train them. You can personalize this form. You can attach it to their behavior plan in school or their IEP, but you can fill it out specifically for your child. I encourage the families to keep an open line of communication with their educators and work on this. This common behaviors and responses plan is part of that safety plan. Basically, it's how to redirect bad behavior. We all need to be on the same page, mom or dad at home, the family, the bus driver, the pair patrol on the pair patrol on the bus, also the educator and the pair patrol at school. So you can fill that out and personalize it for your students. So these forms are all on our website, the Autism Alliance of Michigan. ARI will show you the link here in a little bit. Uh, just remember, encourage families to have emergency plans and packets for home, school, and transportation. They should develop a safety plan for home, school, anywhere their family member goes in the community. Okay, have them enter their information into the 911 database so that their information is flagged. No matter what call goes out to that residence, that first responder is going to get an add-on from dispatch that there is a person with autism or special needs in this home and any type of information that family wants that police officer, firefighter, no. Uh, I would also encourage them to look at Smart 911. That Smart 911, I believe, is in over 1,600 communities across the United States. It's in over around 18 counties in the state of Michigan. Basically, you go on and you develop a profile on Smart 911. You can enter any of your emergency contact information. You can put pictures of your children on there. Uh, you register any of your phones at any time 
you call 911 from any of those phones, your cell phone, your hard line, when you're in a community that has smart 911, your profile will pop up automatically. What's nice about that, if you go away, if you're traveling, this will go with you. You're in a community and your child walks away, wanders away, you have a picture on that profile. If you're in a smart 911 community, you can bring it up automatically and it'll go to the 911 center. Now, reverse 911, this is something to use if a child or a family member with autism goes missing. Most 911 centers will have this or something similar. Basically, it's a reverse call to hard lines and cell phones that are registered with the 911 center. Some 911 centers also have texting capability. If a person with special needs or autism would go missing, the 911 center, the police department, fire department can make a tape message and they can send that call out to all those hard lines and cell phones or that texting information within a certain geographical area. It's a quick way to get our information out there very, care, very quickly and help uh, locate that child or person that's missing. Now, I really want us to promote the use of autism identifiers, those stickers, those decals. They should have these on their vehicles. We are not advertising autism. We're alerting the first responders. There may be somebody in that car, okay, or that professional is pulling up on the scene. Uh, we also want one by the front door of their home. So anytime a first responder, a police officer, a firefighter, an EMT is going up to that house, they're going to see that cling in the window, that magnet on the door. They're going to realize there may be somebody in that home with autism, okay, and we have to take some special precautions. Now, I really encourage the department to have annual training on autism, okay. We've trained approximately 40 percent of the police officers in the state of Michigan. There's a big turnover, there's retirement, there's more hirings, so we're going to keep doing that. Also, always be able to refer your families to that local autism society or that advocacy group. These are great groups of individuals. Uh, generally, they're parents or professionals who have been in, the, been in the field. They have navigated through a lot of these situations. They can help the new families out, the parents, the families out. They're a great resource for them. So really get to know your local autism societies and work with them. Now, what, what I want everybody to remember, especially our first responders, are uh, staff members to remember out there is just relax, role model your behavior. A lot of patience has to be used here, okay? When you're talking to them, keep it short, keep it direct. Remember, it may take them a little bit to answer you. It's how they process things, okay? Be patient. Now, we give our first responders autism reminder cards. We give them all to our bus drivers, our child protective services workers. If you have that in your local community, get those out to your first responders. It's something they can refer back to, okay? And remember, always, always use a family member or a care provider when you're on that call. Nobody knows them better. It, it's all about keeping that person with autism safe, okay? Uh, get to know the families, promote the 911 database, and continue your education. Now, one thing if you're hosting a training for first responders, what we do in the state of Michigan, we always give them resources. I know as a police officer, I was a problem solver and to get my job done, I had to have resources. So make sure you're giving them your local advocacy group, your autism advocacy group. If you have a behavioral health unit, uh, give them their crisis line, their location. Uh, in Michigan, we always give them an Autism Alliance of Michigan. We give them our navigator number. We have a program called the Navigator in the state of Michigan that anybody in the state of Michigan, a family, a educator, a child protective services worker, a police officer, can call this number. They will get our clinical experts, our educational experts, our insurance experts, our safety experts. We will assign a navigator specialist to that family for life, and we will help them where you get your diagnosis how your insurance works and so on. Uh, so be prepared to give your, fam your families resources. They need resources to get their jobs done. 